Our guest today is Dr. Penny Satori. Dr. Penny Satori worked as a nurse in a British hospital for 21 years, 17 of those being in intensive care. She is highly experienced and skilled in her role as an intensive care staff nurse and has conducted unique and extensive research into near-death experiences of her patients. In 2005, she was awarded a PhD for her research into near-death experiences. Dr. Satori's work has received worldwide attention and media coverage. She has spoken at many conferences both nationally and internationally, and her work has received the attention of His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Thank you for watching and enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to United Planet. Today we've come down to South Wales to meet Penny Sartori to talk about her investigations into the near-death experience. Over to you, Penny. Oh, hi. Um, tell us, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, right, well, I started off working as a nurse and I was in intensive care for 17 years. And it was early on in my nursing career that I was looking after a dying patient and I connected with that patient and that changed everything for me. Um, I felt like I'd swapped places with him and he was, he was dying, he was in terrible pain. And when our eyes connected, I felt like I could feel what he was going through. And it really kind of upset me. He was at the end of his life and he was begging me to let him die. And we were doing all that we could to keep him alive. And um, that, for the first time, I, I questioned what I was doing as a nurse. Right. And I thought, I'm just, you know, torturing this man at the end of his life. And he, he wants to die. And it just made me think. And the following day, I couldn't sleep after I'd gone home from my night shift. And I phoned up and they'd said that the man had, had died about two hours after I left. And that just made me really, really depressed. It made me think a lot and I started reading about death. And then I came across near-death experiences and I just thought, oh my God, you know, these, these sound absolutely fantastic. And, you know, why are we all so afraid of death is, if this is what's happening? But I think, you know, because everything about my nurse training was very scientific and I kind of just, thought that these experiences were probably just some sort of hallucination yeah. and but I think I because became, that's what the books tell you well yeah mm. exactly and I, I never thought to question it you yeah. know and it was only when I thought more about this and I thought well what if these people who've had a near-death experience what if what they're saying is correct what if it that happens to all of us as, as we die yeah. and um, I thought well I'm working in intensive care and that's you know a really great place to do my own study mm -hmm. so that's what I decided to do then um, I still continued reading as much as I could on near-death experiences but I started to ask patients then who I was looking after um, if they had any kind of experience at all and um, and then my friends, they knew that I be, I was interested in these experiences. And then through word of mouth, you know, one of them said to me, oh, my uncle had one of those experiences. So I had a chat with him. And then I thought, I really want to study this. And it was almost like a, a little kind of series of synchronicities that mm -hmm. led me to do my formal study then. Okay. So... Mm -hmm. And what were the... So what were the synchronicities? I'll tell you for a while, because... We, we live on synchronicity. Ah, right, okay. We, once you, you've trusted them and you've gone with them and you, exactly. you're where you are, where yeah. you're supposed to be. That's the way we believe it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So if you want to tell us what they were. Well, I was reading about near-death experiences and this book that I read had a chapter written by Professor Paul Badham and it said at the end of the chapter that he uh, worked at Lampeter University and he was the director in the death and immortality course and I thought oh now that sounds really interesting mm -hmm. so I didn't know anything about Professor Badham at the time right. so I wrote to him and I said you know I thought I won't say that I'm really obsessed with near-death experiences you'll think I'm a bit nuts so I just said I'm really interested in death because of my job um, I'm interested in doing your course and the master's course could you give me details of it and it was about six weeks because it was in the days before emails as well this was this was back in early 90s and he wrote back and he said um, give me details of the course and the funding but then he said uh, oh but if you'd be interested in researching near-death experiences 
And as soon as I read that, I, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I phoned him immediately as, as soon as I got that um, the letter. And I spoke to him and he said, well, come up and see me and we can chat about this. And um, it just went from there, really. And where any obstacles could have appeared to yeah. me doing that research, they just fell away. Yeah. And it was, it was as if someone had rolled out a red carpet and all I had to do was walk across it. It yeah. was incredible mm-hmm. the way it just all happened, you know. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. For reasons, isn't it? It's just yeah. happens for reasons. Yeah, definitely. And I feel since doing that, I've really connected with my life purpose. Yes. And um, it's it's strange because once you're on that path, you just can't get off it either. Yeah. You know, it changes your life forever, yeah. doesn't it? You know? Once you salute it and say thank you. Yes. There's, there's more for you, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. Isn't there you That's it. Yeah. You get the thumbs up from the universe telling you you're on the right path. Yeah, yeah. that's you know, right. You know, and that's it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you wish you'd learned, you'd trusted your gut forever, yes. don't you? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. That's I it. know, yeah. yeah. And for the whole of the eight years duration that I was doing my research, I was totally in flow. Mm-hmm. Everything I needed was all there around me all the time. Everything it was just coming to me. It was just incredible. It was magical, yeah. mm-hmm. you know. And then when my research finished... I, I was at a loss. I, I can remember sitting at my computer, you know, just staring, trying to write papers, but I was just, I couldn't do anything. It was just, it was really bizarre once, once it had finished. It was, it was, it took me five years to get over it, really, because mm. I was so used to being in that routine of working, yeah. studying and working on my thesis c- continually, really. And when it had completed, it was just, oh, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. So... So yeah, my, obviously this this subject is very close to my heart. Um, obviously I had a near death experience myself, right. and uh, so I'm very interested to finding mm-hmm. what your outcomes, you know, what you found, you know, research wise, similar stories, or is there many different stories in in, in your research? Basically, what happened was with me was I was 14. Mm-hmm. I was uh, about to have an operation, mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, had a muscle relaxant because um, I was gonna, I was going to have a bone operation. Right. So two pins, two pins, break the bone, right. and leg leg lengthening operation. Right. Um, but they gave me muscle relaxant before the anaesthetic. Oh gosh. And uh, anyway, I felt really ill and looked at my hands. My hands were twice as big, red, swollen, painful, and I felt really, really bad. And um, I said to Mr. Surgeon, look at this, and he saw me, and thinking, oh my goodness, what's happening? Yeah. Bam, bam, and then next thing I'm black. But then I saw myself over, uh, trying to be resuscitated by staff there. Um, but then I got uh, three spirits come over to me uh, saying, don't look at that anymore, come away from there. And I said, okay, fine. I felt like mm-hmm. I knew them. I felt that there were uh, people or spirits or something that I knew before. Right. And I uh, went up with them. And then I went into another realm where I had like a life review. Uh, I could uh, be uh, at my parents' house uh, preparing food for me, thinking like, oh, it's Paul after his operation. Mm-hmm. Felt their emotions. Um, and then... Um, I saw past, present, and future. Times when I wasn't uh, very good, I was, I was bullied at school. Mm-hmm. Um, their emotions, why they were bullying me, mm-hmm. uh, why I became also a bully at the time. Mm-hmm. That, that emotion, uh, every emotion mm-hmm. I could feel. Oh, wow. And um, so, um, and then um, I saw things like those um, areas where people could play, um, you know, and some areas where they could like recharge their battery type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so like almost like showing around a little bit, right. and then uh, got got the option. Uh, do you want to come back to you to where you are, or it was really pushing me though to say like you're too young, you're you've got more experiences, and I felt actually yeah I want to be part of my family, I want to uh-huh. yeah so that's what I did. I decided to uh, go back again. Gosh. And then but I came back feeling like full of beans. God. So. And what was your first memory when you woke up then? Uh, my first memory of, of waking up, I thought that was just a dream and I mm-hmm. thought uh, that was just very vivid. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I thought that was very, because usually I don't remember dreams, right. but that one just stayed with me yeah. and I thought that was very weird. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, was, and I, was, I brushed it off because mm-hmm. 14 and I never That's heard. Yeah. yeah, I never heard of near death experiences, mm-hmm. but it stayed with me. 20 something, I hear what I watched the documentary, just mm. fell into it. I watched the mm. documentary, and I thought, Whoa, yeah, that's me, yeah. And I thought that that's just re, re, uh, re, reinstated saying that's what I had, Gosh. so yeah, 
Yeah, and, I, and I had a big red sticker on my forehead saying, no, don't give this to patient anymore. This. Uh-huh, right. <laughs> well, you'd also saw stuff from your future, hadn't you? I saw your f- oh. future. I saw Russia. I married a Russian lady. Right. I saw, I saw Russia. I saw myself flying over. Uh, I saw, like, as I'm flying, I'm seeing Kremlin. Um, so I've seen landmarks of, of Russia. I'm thinking, why is that? Didn't know until you saw yourself driving. I saw myself driving. Yeah. The thing yeah. Was, yeah. You were born a slightly different way. Yeah, and I never thought yeah. I'd be driving. So a wow. lot of the things you saw as a as a grown yeah. man. Mm. Never thought I would. Oh, I yeah. Think. And but I didn't see myself getting married. But I think it was I got married in, not in the church. I didn't get married in the uh-huh. in the style of a white dress woman. You know, right. she she was actually wearing a, a blue dress. Uh-huh. Um, but I remember seeing some kind of ceremony. But it wasn't uh, the ceremony I, I I envisioned as a wedding. Right. But I remember seeing that as well. Gosh. So I can remember certain things that you know in future. But I didn't know what it was. Even past life, I I saw um like previous death of like being like in um, dying on the on spikes. Right. Uh, you know, because we like in many different times. Yeah. So I don't know if I was like a reincarnation or somebody else's being of of it because I, I know that we are one consciousness experiencing mm-hmm. itself so yeah um maybe i was experiencing someone else's i don't know wow how many past lives did you see um i just saw more like the one uh, which was like a roman or right. a, a greek or something where i'm just falling on spikes right uh, but did I you just, yeah land forward forward right on spikes Stop. Uh, like a, like almost like a like a pool of of spikes, weird to say, God. but like a and just been being impaled in these spikes, wow. um, yeah. But I felt that like it was like a oldy worldy type of uh, mm. vision. Um, that's why I remember that. So where did that play out in your near death experience? Was it at the beginning of it, or did it all kind of play out at once? Once, yeah, almost like um, everything was like a download. Right. It felt like it just like um, past, present, future. All the ones, yeah, it right. could be anything. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, you know, you just go here, there, and it, yeah, it's just like downloaded. Right. That's what it felt like. Was it like looking at something on a screen, or was it? Yeah, that that's that's the weirdest thing. I can't describe what it was. Yeah. I mean, I I I envisioned it like like a a well TV well okay. type thing. Yeah. But it wasn't that. I can't right. describe what it was. I can't. It's hard wow. to it's hard to say what it was. Yeah. It was experience yeah. did you have any after effects as if um did it affect your electromagnetic field at all in what way is that I mean, do you so. get any electrical sensitivity so do you get computers crashing that you use? not really my wife does oh but i, I yeah i guess I've, uh, i don't turn off at things but i when i'm in a rush or when i'm angry i can't find what i want but maybe that's just me being uh-huh. upset and angry right. i don't know is that, a, is that a thing, is it? Yeah, it can affect your electromagnetic field. Not with everyone, but some people will have a near-death experience. So a lot of people can't wear a wristwatch after. So it could be a digital one or a wind-up one. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they'll stop working or they'll lose time for them for some reason. And that's something that really fascinates me. And I'd like to research that further because that's potentially something you can measure as well. So yeah, that okay. would give another interesting aspect of it. Wow, I didn't know that. Mm. And a lot of people don't really associate it until I make that connection for them when I have a chat and I, I'll say, and they say, oh my gosh, yeah, funny enough, since my near-death experience, I haven't been able to wear a watch. So uh, so how do you find your subjects to interview? Well, that's an interesting question because when I first started, right, it was really difficult to find anyone and it was all literally word of mouth through friends and things like that. And I then, as my research in hospital progressed, more and more through that. But then after I finished my PhD, it was in 2006 and there was a national newspaper did an article on my research and they put my email address in there. And I had about 600 emails from that and loads of people wrote to me at the university as well. But then when my book, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences came out in 2014, it was in another um, daily newspaper and it was serialized and it was only meant to do two articles, but there was such a response from it that they did five articles. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I have got over 14,000 emails awaiting my response. I've responded to loads of them, and that was a full-time job in itself over the period of about six months. But I've still got about 14,000 that are outstanding that I can't respond to. Wow. 
but if you look at the comments as well online from that newspaper yeah. they would they were predominantly uh, really positive comments as well uh -huh. and i was dreading it being serialized in the newspaper because i didn't know how it was going to be received and if it would be slated or anything but people have started their attitudes are changing towards these experiences yeah, that's good. much more receptive to yeah. them now and people are taking notice you know and it's, it's right. so important because these to me are just so you know they're such fasc fascinating experiences mm -hmm. that we can learn so much from you know mm -hmm. do you think that western culture and eastern culture their view of life and death like mm -hmm. chalk and cheese, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, very different. We're terrified of death. Yes. We're terrified of talking about death, yeah. dealing with the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, that's it. We completely we, brush it. don't embrace it, it, do they? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. No, we always kind of say, you know, push it to one side or it's not going to happen to me yeah. sort of thing until it does. It's the one thing that you guarantee is yes. going to happen to you. Isn't <laughs> absolutely. Nobody's promised tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Obviously, everybody wants to die at old age, in the sleep, yeah. pain, painless. Uh -huh. But the reality is, Death mm -hmm. is a thing that happens yeah. every day, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. You know. Often when least expected as well. Yeah. You know, I'd work in intensive care mm -hmm. and, you know, someone would leave their house in the morning to go to work and they'd end up in intensive care mid-morning yeah. through some accident or something yeah. like that. You mm -hmm. know, you just... That's one of the things working in intensive care does. It brought home to me how precious life is and how it can change in an instant like that. So have you interviewed, like, um, Indians, Asian people? Have they got a different take on it? What people have written to me. Yeah. Um, the people I interviewed for my research were predominantly Welsh because there weren't that many different cultures okay. really admitted. Right. But um, throughout the years, lots of people from different cultures have written to me as well. So, yeah, and it, they are culturally influenced as well. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so say here we're more likely to see images of Jesus um, and you'd get a life review, whereas someone in India might get a different experience and what they might see instead of having a life review itself they meet um a man with a book of deeds and that's a record of all of the things that they've done in their life so it's very much like a near-death experience but it, um like the life review but it's interpreted in a slightly different way okay. so there's similar sort of themes but it's just culturally different so what how do you how does that work out then how, so is it your mind producing this or is it I mean, obviously, if it's a one one place we're all going to, it doesn't matter what colour or religion you are. Yeah, that's but right. the fact, is it their interpretation of what they're saying? The, their way that they show you it? Yes. Yeah. The that's, way that you understand. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, yeah, yeah it's mm. a, they're all kind of different images, really, within the near-death experience. So you interpret that according then to your cultural filter. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's, I, you know, it's... it's the same underlying experience really yeah. but it's just in two it is the same underlying experience i would mm -hmm. say so yeah just different yeah. similarities yes mm -hmm. different cultural influence as well yeah. you know so mm -hmm. yeah different deities would be seen lots of different things you know so whatever resonates with a person yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay and because you know even in the west People who are an atheist as well can have a near-death experience and meet religious figures as well, you yeah. know. But if you think about it, you know, we we have these religious figures around us all the time anyway, you know, since you're small, you know. It's in you, your subconscious, you know, isn't it? Yeah, mm. that's right, it's there. So it's these sort of things. And during the near-death experience, that's what you kind you're of... You're going to associate. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it change at all, do you think, with ages as well? You know, like, do have you interviewed anyone that's quite young, like children? And yeah. Children have the experience as well. Um, there were there was some research to say that children didn't have a, a life review as well, but yeah, they ha they do get a life review. Obviously, it's not as detailed as an adult experience, mm -hmm. but I've recently commu had communications with a lady who had an experience when she was quite young, and um, she still remembers bits of her childhood from interacting with her small brother as well, you know. Um, again, with children, they tend to see pets as well. Right. So, um, okay. yeah, I think they've got kind of less people around them who have died as well, really, if you think about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose it's also that, like you said, the kid's reference point. Mm -hmm. If you go, if you had a little 10 year old kid here, so yeah. tell us what you saw. Yes. Yeah, can't make any sense of it because he's got no reference of anything mm -hmm. to do with life, really, has he? Mm -hmm. But That's when it. you talk about yourself as a 14 year old, mm -hmm. looking back as a man, mm -hmm. You can you can vocalise it, can't you? you can, yeah. You can relate to what you were seeing and, mm -hmm. and 
So yeah, that made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. So if you went to be that kid in 15 years' time, you'd yeah. probably have a different handle on it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Maybe something yes. you saw then that didn't make any diff yeah. any sense to him. Mm. Yeah. Would in future, yeah, yeah, was, yeah, if 14 year old you would have said, oh yeah, I flew over the Kremlin. Yeah. You would have. Mm. But it's only when you've married a Russian lady, mm -hmm. it resonates with you now, doesn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you were working at the hospital, mm -hmm. did you get any grief from the people above? What are you doing? Leave these people alone. Well, surprisingly, no, I didn't. Um, again, when I had to do, to do my research, I had to go through the ethics committee and I had to get a lot of permissions. It was a lot of red tape to actually get the permission to do the research. Oh, it wasn't um, just tea and biscuit by the bed? And no. Can I, can I quiz you? Can I quiz you while I'm not here? No, it was a proper, <laughs> you know, thorough investigation. So right. I had to go through the ethics, uh, ethics committee. Um, and then, in fact, the... The consultants who I worked with, the doctors, at first I didn't know how they were going to receive it, you know, because they could have easily said, oh, no way, you're not doing yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But they were really open-minded to it and they could see that it was for the benefit of the patient because mm -hmm. we were getting a deeper understanding. So I was really lucky. I worked with a great team of doctors and nurses and they were all really supportive and really helpful to the research as well. Yeah. And um, at the end of the research as well, they still valued how the importance of it, and they asked my advice on certain policies that they were doing for end of life care and things. And um, I can remember the the consultant that was doing the ward round one day, and there were some new doctors just joined, and um, they stopped the ward round and said, right, with them. Um, as people are approaching death, you want to go and speak to Penny about her research as well. So they really did take it seriously, you know. Right. And uh, there was one man in my research who reported a near-death experience when the ward round was going on. And the consultant actually documented it in the notes as well. And he said, oh, you need to go and speak to Penny about that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was really great because the doctors were so receptive to it as well then. Right. Because also, I've obviously watched some of interviews with yourself, and I've noticed that uh, there were certain things in the room that people were putting things quite high up. Yes. So, did, so did many people see those things? Or? They didn't, no. unfortunately. No. So what I did, at, at everyone's bedside, there's like um, the cardiac monitor. So it was mounted off the wall. Yeah. And it was in the days before flat screens. So they were all these big things, like big televisions. Mm -hmm. So it was the ideal place to hide um, a symbol. And I concealed it behind ridges so you couldn't see it if you were really tall. Right. The only way you could see it was if you're out of your body. Mm -hmm. So in the research, there were eight patients who reported the out-of-body experience. But what I found is that some of them didn't float high enough. So some of them only floated about four foot above their body, yeah. not high enough to see. Some people floated into the middle of the room, couldn't see it. But there were two people who had the kind of experience where they would have been in a position to view that symbol but both of those patients said to me i was so interested with what was going on around my body i wasn't looking for any symbol at all okay so yeah. and it was a whole it was a, a lot of hard work because i had to dump dust those symbols every week as well you know oh, to make yeah. sure they didn't get any dust on them as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, but no no one saw it but then you know i think it might, it might take a long time to get anyone to, to see those, if anyone would. You know, there's a lot of, since doing that research, I've communicated with a lot of people who do have out-of-body experiences, and they say flat images like that wouldn't really do it. You've yeah. got to have something that's substantial, like an object as well, something mm -hmm. that they can look th as three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So if I was to do any future research, I would do it a little bit differently as well. Mm -hmm. So near-death experience... Astral projection, is there any connection? Um, well, yeah, there could be, because with astral projection, people can kind of, kind of train their mind yeah. to do it, and they, some people can just do it spontaneously as well. Yeah. You know, one of my nursing colleagues years ago, when she was younger, she said she was, was able to get into a relaxed state, and then she could leave her body, and she could look inside a wardrobe as well and tell you what was inside the wardrobe, mm -hmm. even though she hadn't looked in there before. But she said it used to really freak her out yeah. and she was afraid she wouldn't get back into her body. So she really didn't like doing it at all. And sometimes it would happen spontaneously. Yeah. And I suppose with the difference with the near-death experience, it's very kind of spontaneous and you can't plan to have a near-death experience. It just happens out of the blue, you know. 
and then people are just often just find themselves out of their body wondering how they got there not understanding the experience and then just find themselves back in the body so i suppose there are there are connections with astral travel and near-death experience have you have you tried to find the connections or do you think it's separate in it could be something to do with the way in which the brain is working and that was the only thing that i found with my research in the hospital the only thing people who had the near-death experience had in co- the only thing they had in common with each other is that their brains wouldn't have, weren't functioning as they would do normally so they were unconscious for some reason whatever that reason is okay. and again that made me think well consciousness if the brain produces consciousness these people were unconscious how could it produce a state where there should be no consciousness you know if you have a cardiac arrest after within about 10 to 15 minutes your EEG on your brain the brain waves go flat so you shouldn't really have any conscious experience but what these patients were reporting was a heightened state of reality you know what they said is realer than real it's not nothing dumbed down or damped down so putting you on the spot mm-hmm. you're saying consciousness is a separate entity I don't oh, I'm not saying, I'm, yeah. I'm asking you, I'm not telling mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I think that the, we've been led to believe by the scientific materialist belief that the brain produces consciousness, yeah. but I don't think it produces consciousness. In view with the research that I've undertaken and the studies that I've done, it makes more sense to view the brain as a mediator of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And so it perceives consciousness, and I think the brain acts like a kind of filter. And usually this heightened state of reality or this consciousness is screened out of our everyday waking reality but i think there are times in our life when that filter expands or relaxes and this heightened state of consciousness is allowed into the everyday consciousness so you know examples of when that can happen is during a near-death experience when people take certain kind of drugs mind-altering drugs like dmt um ayahuasca and things like that all those sorts of drugs can relax that filter a bit as yeah. well uh-huh. so uh-huh. and meditation as well similar experiences happen during peak experiences of meditation yeah. so you know there's lots of different experiences of what this consciousness is and it's experienced in different contexts which can influence how the so what do you believe um, i believe that uh, Consciousness is you primary. Know, you, you know more than most. You, you, mm-hmm. If you read a thousand mm-hmm. um, statements, all yeah. telling you there's a current, there's a certain thing that you're seeing, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't take an idiot to work out. Yeah. You know, so. Mm. Yeah. So yes, yeah, through reading different testimonies and yeah. from talking to different people, but I think the thing that did it for me was actually working in the hospital and doing that research in the yeah. hospital, being present as someone was having a near-death experience like the case of patient 10 i was actually there at the time he had his experience didn't realize he was having a near-death experience until he regained consciousness four four hours later and he was very excited about something trying to tell the doctors and describe this near-death experience and everything (coughs) everything that he described during the time when he was deeply unconscious happened, you know, he described my actions, he described the actions of the physiotherapist, he described which consultant had examined him, although he hadn't seen that doctor prior to losing consciousness that day, everything he said was completely accurate. And further to that, this man has cerebral palsy as well. So his right hand is in a permanently contracted position like this. After his near death experience, he can open it out fully. And physiologically, that should not be possible. So I think actually doing that research, being there in the clinical environment while these experiences were happening, it was a unique experience. It was incredible. And I think that is what sealed it for me, actually being there when these experiences happen. I I couldn't deny them. I couldn't rationalise them away. And I think from that perspective, it means that you know, I had to question everything that I'd been led to believe about consciousness as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it opened my eyes, definitely. Mm-hmm. In regards to the cerebral palsy uh, side mm-hmm. of things, so why do you think that, that happened? Why the change of his, of his hand? Or his I don't know. You see, that to me is fascinating. Yeah. 
I've asked the doctors about this and I've asked the physios and they said there's no way that could happen Penny, no way you'd yeah. need, because his hand would be in that permanently contracted position, yeah. the tendons would be shortened, yeah. so to open his hand out he would have to have an operation to release the tendons, yeah. well that wasn't done, you know I checked his notes to see if he'd had extensive hand physio, nothing like that was done and so that's the thing if we understood that yeah. think about how many people Absolutely. out there have similar ailments and who require surgery yeah. we'd save the nhs millions of pounds every year Absolutely, it's incredible so yeah. why aren't people curious about this why don't people look this at it is the in thing depth? we always come back to mm -hmm. yeah isn't it yeah, yeah. this knowledge yeah. that you're scratching not you're scratching yeah. the surface yeah. but yeah. We we're trying to make sense of it yeah. and it comes down to why isn't this available yeah that's it Absolutely. because nobody wants healthy happy mm -hmm. citizens do they that don't uh -huh, yeah they don't want That's right. you know it doesn't make, Can't make profit don't make that, money out yeah. of yeah mm -hmm. so when you say it like that obviously mm -hmm. you're thinking how many people could be free yeah. to do all sorts of things that yeah. they don't need to yeah be taking tablets or taking yeah. whatever it is exactly mm -hmm. it's crazy in a crazy know. world it is. 